Welcome to APSA's second applicant interactive session of the 21-22 academic year in partnership with APSA's virtual summer research program. We are excited today to present a career panel where you can learn more about the various career paths available to physician scientists. Our panelists represent physician scientist leaders with diverse career trajectories and who are leaders in epidemiology, anthropology, basic and translational research, clinical medicine, and advocacy. Thank you to the panelists for being here today. We're grateful that you took the time out of your day to join us virtually to provide some of your wisdom. My name is Brianna Macedo. I'm an undergraduate at Princeton University and organizer of the virtual summer research program and I will be the moderator today. Some housekeeping notes before we get started. For those of you who are going to have to step away or miss a piece of this session, a reminder that we will have it recorded and it will be available on the applicant interactive series website in one to two weeks. As the moderator, I will remind you to please submit your questions in the Q&A box and not the chat box. Our co-moderator, Michael Granavetter, will be behind the scenes collecting questions live. We'll try to get as many answered as we can. Thank you again for everyone for being here. And panelists, before you get to the questions, could we please go around and have each of you take a few minutes to introduce yourself and your backgrounds. Okay, I'll call people, <laughs> Dr. Mensa. Thanks, Brianna, and thanks, Michael, for hosting this. Can you hear me all right? Uh, my name is Kofi Mensa, and I'm an MD, PhD. I'm a rheumatologist by clinical training, and that's what I do in terms of seeing patients. Uh, for those who might not know, a rheumatologist is a type of physician who treats patients who have autoimmune diseases, including arthritis and lupus. Um, and I also have a PhD, as I mentioned, and that PhD is in immunology, and we can talk more about um, my research interests, uh, but in the interest of time, I'll just continue. And um, right now, I split my time between seeing patients and, at Yale University, where I'm on the faculty in the rheumatology and allergy immunology. I also I'm a senior director of early clinical development for Bristol Myers Squibb, which is a pharmaceutical company. In that capacity, I help translate the discoveries happening in the basic science labs into early clinical trials where we can determine whether or not our hypotheses on how a particular uh, chemical compound or monoclonal antibody might work, uh, how that actually plays out in humans for the first time. Thank you, Dr. Paredes. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the invitation to this great conference. Um, my name is Mercedes Paredes. I'm a faculty member in the Department of Neurology and in the Neurosciences and Developmental Stem Cell Bio Program at the University of California in San Francisco, uh, UCSF um, in the Bay Area, for those of you who may not know the institution. Um, I am uh, MD that uh, focuses on epilepsy. I see adult epilepsy patients, particularly those with neurodevelopmental disorders, uh, such as autism and cerebral palsy. Um, and that ties in with my work uh, in the lab. I do, I'd say 80, uh, 80 to 85% in the basic science lab where um, my group studies human brain development and models of human brain development, particularly focusing on what we call the perinatal period the time right before and after birth. We think that's a really uh, unexplored period of brain development and particularly in large brains like humans or uh, piglets that we also study in the brain uh, in our lab. Um, there's a lot still going on even after birth. So for those of you with little siblings or cousins or such, um, there's a lot of great dynamic changes, interesting changes happening. Um, so that's kind of my main uh, crux of work. I also do a lot with mentoring and teaching I am now serving um, as the Associate Director for the MSDP program. And in particular, I like to focus on thinking about how to encourage underrepresented in the physician scientist training path. Um, you know, I think there's a lot to be said about uh, this combination of career and the unique challenges that it takes to um, get trained for this long path, which is wonderful. 
um, but it is long and has a lot of different uh, twists and turns. And so I definitely work on, for all trainees, thinking about how to improve this process, but in particular for women and those from underrepresented backgrounds, that we need more of us uh, and you uh, in this field. Um, so I do a lot of kind of mentoring and teaching with that. Uh, and then another hat that I work on uh, is working on different uh, diversity committees here within our Department of Neurology and in our grad programs. Um, again, on the STEM side, uh, focusing on basic science, trying to promote and recruit trainees of diverse backgrounds. Thank you, Dr. Beltra. All right, thank you so much. I think I have probably taken the most uh, winding, twisting route to get here. And I don't know that I exactly belong. I'm like one of those things that doesn't belong on the panel. Um, so I actually started off as an MD PhD program here at University of Pennsylvania, where I am now. And then I actually got sick with a life-threatening illness. This was before the Affordable Care Act, had to drop out of my PhD. Um, actually then got a master's in public health um, with the one year off that I had forced on me in medical school. Uh, finished medical school so I could get a job, residency, um, which comes with healthcare. And then actually completed my PhD during my fellowship and my instructorship in epidemiology because I realized with my master's that I no longer wanted to be basic science. I really, really loved epidemiology. So currently I have a dual appointment. I'm at the University of Pennsylvania. I specialize in inflammatory bowel disease in adult patients. I'm um, here, I have a continuity clinic. I do procedures, I do my service time. But my secondary appointment is in the Division of Epidemiology, Biostatistics, and Bioinformatics here in the Center for Clinical Epi and Biostatistics. Um, there, I specialize in epidemiology, uh, in particular methodology called Discrete Choice Experiment, or DCE. I course direct several of their epidemiology courses, mentor students, a couple students every year, sit on a lot of committees. And my research there is really two-pronged, uh, the traditional pharmacoepi research and outcomes research, and then also research related to DCE. Um, but then the third part of my research, I started and lead up the prospective cohort and biobank of our inflammatory bowel disease patients here at Penn. So I do that in collaboration with our Institute of Immunology. So I do a lot of translational research through that as well. So I'm back to the immunology that I originally was going to do my MD PhD in and didn't. Um, and then I also started and lead up an R25 NIDDK um, undergraduate clinical research scholars program. And this is really to foster especially women and underrepresented minorities in clinical research, starting at undergrads to give them the tools so that they can go through and really get, um, get mentorship and, and projects under their belt so that they can be successful starting early in their career. And then finally, I'm on the board of trustees for the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation and also on the national board of Doctors for America. So I head up the COVID committee, a lot of their advocacy committees, very strong advocate for getting increased funding from the NIH for research. Um, stand, uh, increasing access to healthcare because it really doesn't matter what the next drug is that I research. If my patients can't see me, uh, then I can't get it to them. So we really need to expand healthcare and then combating misinformation. I've been focusing on vaccines for a couple of years. Um, unfortunately, it's taken on a whole new meaning in the last year or so. Um, and so that's pretty much what I do. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sufferin. Hi everyone, um, it's great to be on this panel and also to hear from my esteemed panelists about your paths. Um, so my name is Carolyn Suffren. Um, I'm at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine um, and also at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School, School of Public Health. Um, clinically, I am a, uh, an OBGYN by training and I did fellowship training in complex family planning. So that's my clinical area of specialty. Um, and my PhD is in medical anthropology. And I also had a circuitous path to that um, where I was an undergraduate, uh, and I'll explain, uh, actually I should probably explain first what medical anthropology is for those who may not be familiar with it. It's a social science. Um, and it's a branch of sociocultural anthropology. Um, so it deals with contemporary societies. Um, this is, I'm not the kind of anthropologist who studies evolution or archeology. span um, And medical anthropology has to do with, it's a very broad field that considers the intersection of health, illness, well-being, meanings of health systems um, and organizations. Um, and I think my six-year-old is knocking at the door, forgive me. Um, I'm just going to ignore that. Um, so it has to do with also um, inequalities and, um, and health systems. 
I think if I explain what my research is in, it will give an illustration. So my research focuses on mass incarceration and reproductive health care. Um, so I study the politics of reproduction as it plays out in prisons, jails, and other institutions of incarceration. And the circuitous path I took to get here is that I was an undergraduate anthropology major, um, thought about getting a PhD, but then ultimately went to medical school, but felt this constant pull towards anthropology. Um, I was encouraged to take a year off and get a master's in anthropology, and I did that. Considered staying on getting a PhD at that point, but I really was craving getting back to clinical medicine. Um, and then it was when I was in a fellowship and I um, was volunteering working in the San Francisco County Jail um, as the OBGYN doctor um, that I, I felt the pull back to anthropology as I was confronted by various complexities of providing care in a space of punishment. Um, and so I felt like I needed the tools of social analysis and theory um, from anthropology. And that's when I went get back and got my PhD in medical anthropology. Um, so now I wear many hats like all of us here as a clinician, I'm an OBGYN. Um, and my research still focuses on reproductive health care for incarcerated women, um, whether that's through public health oriented research, clinicals for health services research, research, ethnography, which is the mainstay of anthropology. And then I also have an advocacy hat as well. Um, I do national advocacy, whether it's partnering with um, um, advocacy organizations to pass legislation to prohibit the shackling of pregnant women who are incarcerated, or whether it's serving on, on the board of the National Commission on Correctional Healthcare or advocacy through the American College of OBGYNs. All of my work, whether it's research as advocacy, is focused on improving conditions for incarcerated women. Thank you. Thank you to all the panelists. I'm very excited to hear from all of you as you all have very unique and diverse backgrounds in what you're studying. And I think that'll be uh, very useful for our participants. So again, for the people on the call, please put questions in the Q&A as we go. Um, the whole session is going to be a Q&A, so you can ask throughout. So for our first question, and some of you already touched on this, but could you talk about the difference between MD-PhD and MD-PhD programs and why you chose to do both and how that influenced your career? We're a very polite panel. <laughs> um, I, I'll just start off um, maybe and then we can kind of, it sounds like great in terms of everyone seems to have taken a different journey. So I think that just goes to show you something I hope that people come out with is there's so many paths to getting to become a physician scientist, clinician scientist, and the definition of what that is also can have a lot of different roles, as you can see here. So um, I just think it's uh, the excitement and the passion of both being clinically involved and engaged, and then having some investigative uh, discovery or clarity uh, component, I think that, um, you know, that you want to figure out how you want to get trained for. Uh, I'll just briefly maybe give my, my path as a MD, PhD um, that did a kind of a formalized medical scientist training program. Um, and that is the MSTP program. Uh, that is uh, a lot uh, kind of the classical, uh, I guess, quote approach. Though again, other ways to do it. Um, and that what I did was I, uh, I took some time off after college uh, did the what typically is the preclinical years, which can be anywhere from a year, year and a half now. Um, then did a PhD, and then ended with uh, the clinical clerkship time, the actual rotations of your third year of medicine, um, and then kind of finished off med school. So that is the route the route that I took um, to get uh, both an MD and a PhD. Um, I'll let the others explain kind of maybe other routes or opportunities. Why I did the way I did, um, I'll just say is I did not, uh, when I went to college, I did not know uh, the differences in routes. Um, I didn't even know that I wanted to do research. I knew I didn't want to do medicine. <laughs> Actually, it was what I knew I didn't want to do, I thought. Um, I got really excited about research through uh, jobs that I got in college. And then in the lab, I saw a lot of um, what I thought at that time, like really happy, but chaotic people who were uh, running around doing a lot of different things. Um, and when I talked to them, I realized that they were physician scientists, people who were seeing patients on the outside quote when they weren't with me in the lab um, and then would come back and ask uh, their research questions. Um, 
you know, a lot of them were in, uh, had just finished their residency or the clinical training. So we're trying to get, um, get formalized in their independent research gig. Um, and I just really thought that was really fun. Um, and they all seemed to love what they were doing as busy and as um, uh, kind of, again, just everywhere they were, they seemed to be doing a lot of different things. They just really seemed to enjoy it. And the questions that they were asking, I thought were really fun kind of discovery again, but um, very intellectual, but really seem to potentially have applications, you know, maybe not directly, but just like, I, I like that idea of that's something I'm, I'm creatively doing could have some impact outside. And so they introduced me to this idea of an MSTP program. That was kind of one role or one way to do MST or MD, PhD or physician scientist. I'll go next um, because I've I, I had a we all had different paths, um, but I, I already alluded to this a little bit about how I thought about a PhD at different points. And what I'll say about MD versus PhD versus MD PhD is that for me, I found um, medical school is hard. Don't get me wrong; it requires a lot of hard work and stamina. Um, but in some ways, I found it easier than my doctoral program because. When you're a medical student, you know what's expected of you. Like you have a discrete set of information that you have to acquire. You show up to rounds, you see your patients and write, you know, there, there's, it's very clear what's expected. And there isn't that much um, independent thought, um, which I know sounds strange, but it's, it's more of a, of a prescribed um, knowledge base for you to acquire um, that you then, you know, transfer into clinical skills. And doctoral, doctoral studies, it relies on your creativity. You, of course, have a, uh, there is, of course, a fund of knowledge that you have to acquire. Um, but for me, that creativity and asking my own research questions and figuring out how to answer them, for my mind, that is, is harder. Um, and I love it. Um, but I, that was one of the reasons that I did not do a PhD earlier on, um, because I didn't have any, um, anything that compelled me enough to, to apply that creativity and to ask research questions. And so even though I loved medical anthropology since I was an undergraduate, other than knowing that it was important and, uh, and the, the, world, the, the way through which I analyzed the world and, and social problems and, and medical issues, it just wasn't enough. It wasn't enough to keep going, to, to go through the, um, a PhD program. And so um, for me, it wasn't until I, I was immersed in this unusual setting of a jail, being a healthcare provider in jail, that's what prompted for me the anthropological creative research questions. So sometimes being in a clinical environment can prompt research questions in a way that just, you know, reading about things doesn't. Um, and so that's why for me, I took that circuitous route. I would say what, some of the benefits of that um, for me were that I, it was easier for me to fund my graduate studies because I worked part-time as a physician while I was also a graduate student. Um, and that, um, that allowed me to fund graduate school in ways that I didn't have to stress about grant funding. I still applied for grants, but um, I didn't, if I didn't get them, it didn't preclude my staying. Um, and, you know, although I love, I, I wish I had taught when I was a, a graduate student um, as a teaching assistant or taught my own course, it also slows you down a lot. Um, and, you know, the average time to finish a, an anthropology PhD is seven years average. Um, and I just didn't have that, that time in my career and, and my life to, to spend that, that long. And so not teaching class, I could get out of teaching and focus on my research and my dissertation um, because my, my side work as a physician could, could fund, um, fund my PhD. So I'll, I'll pause there. I'm happy to answer more questions specifically about those, some of those differences I mentioned. I mean, I can go next and I'll say that, again, I, I took this non-traditional route. I really knew I wanted to be an MD, PhD. I thought I wanted to do it in immunology. Now I know I'm not as smart as, as Dr. Mensa, so I would never have been able to do it in the first place. Um, but really, I, I had a life-changing event and that happens to everybody, right? That can happen at any time. And in my particular case, it was a life-changing event in the setting of, of not having access to great healthcare. Um, and I needed to make a choice. And so I chose the MD, but I always knew I still was very interested in doing research predominantly in my career. Um, 
and I wanted to do the most rigorous level of research I possibly could. Now, when I got my master's, that was the first opportunity I had to really experience um, clinical research. And it was eye-opening because I realized I really, really loved epidemiology and I really loved biostatistics. I'm terrible at math, but somehow I love it still. And, um, and this is why, you know, I think somebody had asked a question in the chat and it is very unfortunate that many don't get opportunities to get access or exposure to clinical research. Um, early on in their careers. And that's part of the reason why we started this program. But I still sort of dovetailed, came back and, and you got into um, my residency. And at the University of Pennsylvania, they offer a master's in, pub in at clinical epidemiology. I already had a master's in public health. I felt like the master's in clinical epi wasn't going to push me as far as I wanted. And so I really tried to leverage my MPH to get my PhD as well. I was a little weird. Uh, teaching in the same division I was paying tuition to. It's a very odd sort of situation to find yourself in. Um, but the really particular focus that I found myself drawn to this, this methodology called discrete trace um, experiment is not something that's been widely done in clinical research. It is increasingly a little bit now, but it really does require more in-depth understanding of, of um, statistical methods and epidemiological methods of conducting the research. And that required a very rigorous training, um, which I think you really get with a PhD. And so one of the questions was why not do a summer research fellowship instead of a PhD? And I think you're hearing from everybody that they really wanted to answer the question a little bit more rigorously, get a little bit more training in that. And I do think it makes your career a little bit more complex. I'm sure all of us appreciate that, um, the role between an MD and the PhD. But I think you get to bring a very unique voice to your science from your MD background, and you get to bring a very unique voice to your, to your um, MD from your science background. And that was really what I wanted to achieve with my, my research as well. Okay, so, um, you know, as you've been hearing, uh, there are lots of different ways to, to get involved with this. And, um, when I was at the stage of perhaps most of the attendees, um, the only way that I had known about this were two ways. Either you go to medical school and you end up doing a fellowship and there would be research associated with that fellowship. Typically when you do any kind of fellowship, there's some research associated to it. It doesn't have to be in the web bench at the basic science level. It can be any manner of research. Um, and the other option was to do an MS, uh, an MD-PhD program, and Dr. Paredes mentioned that MSTP is one of those forms. That's an NIH-funded uh, MD-PhD pathway, and so that's what I did. And my reason for doing an MSTP was, uh, as Dr. Pedro was just saying, it gives you a chance to have a more formal, uh, rigorous training process. It doesn't mean that the other forms don't provide that. Um, and I think I came to appreciate that later on as going through. And, um, you know, it's good that you are all attending this because maybe you can learn something at this stage that I didn't know at, at this stage. And so my default was to go with the option that seemed to have the most laid out path. And then, of course, as any person who's gone through any sort of medical training will tell you on the other end, it doesn't matter what laid out path was there before you, you'll end up finding something that you never thought you would or you'll get to a destination that you probably didn't think you would get to by the route that you took. And you've just heard four examples of people doing things that probably five to 10 years ago, they didn't think they would be doing right now for various reasons. Um, so I think keep an open mind. Uh, I think try to understand all of the options and really that's what this panel hopefully will provide for you is what these various options are. You know, and I, I have colleagues who uh, did their PhD during fellowship as Dr. I have colleagues who uh, started MD PhD programs and then decided that they wanted to take a different course, you know, as we just heard from Dr. Bertrand as well. And it could be for, you know, things happen in life that we can't plan for, but you have to sort of be nimble and you find yourself coming out successful and enjoying what you like doing regardless. And I think that's something hard, I think, to appreciate when you're younger and maybe when you don't quite know what all the options are. And, those of you thinking about medical school, that's a very prescribed pathway. I mean, there's four years of college, or maybe five if you take a year out to do something, four or five years of medical school. Then there's a residency program that you have to do a certain number of years to be accredited. Then there's a fellowship that's a certain number. So everything has like 
three to five years kind of locked into it. So, you know, there's not much creativity there. And then you sort of find yourself later on in training saying, well, there are other ways I could have gotten to this point or there are other opportunities. And I told you that I'm in uh, working with a pharmaceutical company. That was another opportunity that, that availed itself. That's not something that I would have necessarily thought of um, 10 years ago. So uh, keep an open mind. It's good that you're asking these questions. Um, and uh, as you can see, you know, everyone on this panel is successful and none of us took the same route to get there. Thank you all. So next we have a two part question. First, what does your day, week, year look like as a physician scientist? And what has your work life balance been like both now and during training? Okay, can I take an unpopular opinion here? That I think that work-life balance is like a mythical unicorn that is out there to make you all feel bad because you haven't achieved it yet. So it's another one of those things on your checklist that you haven't achieved and you're inadequate and whatever, and you can never achieve it. It doesn't exist. Um, so I, and I, again, I, I feel like that maybe that's not what we're supposed to be telling people, but I think that it is, um, I think it's really, you know, very true here. Um, my typical like day, week, month is complex. It's a lot of work. Um, it's, um, you know, sometimes my weeks on my calendar look like a fluorescent marker vomited all over it. And definitely, I don't think that I've always ever, I don't even think there is a year that I can think of where I've taken all six weeks of the available vacation during the time because I'm married to an MD PhD. And so this is two MD PhD careers that are colliding with each other. It's, it's massively crazy. Um, but I think the most, I think it, it is hard uh, at times. There are gonna be times when you're gonna feel like the worst doctor and there are times when you're gonna feel like you're the worst scientist. And there are times you're going to feel like the worst parent. I have a 10 year old and a six year old. And, and, you know, I, I oftentimes think my greatest accomplishment is they have matching shoes when they go to school. Yay for me. Um, it's just because you cannot be the best at, at absolutely everything all of the time. It's kind of like what Abraham Lincoln said, right? You can please some of the people all the time and all of the people some of the time, but you cannot please all of the people all of the time. Um, I think you have to be very, very, you, you need to enjoy what you're doing. Don't do an MD or a PhD simply because you think this is what you're supposed to do. Like this is the career path or this is the peak of the career and I need to be the best, all the, do all the best and be all the best. That's not the reason to do it. Do it because you love it because you need to still love it when it is kicking your butt and you're exhausted and ev you're failing everything and everything's been rejected. You have to still love and still believe what you're doing. And then the long hours aren't, don't feel like long hours anymore. You know, I, you know, I don't mind uh, writing a grant or, or doing a manuscript because I love the stuff that went into it and I'm excited about it and I'm passionate about it and I believe in it. And so it's okay if it's a, you know, another hour before I go to bed or whatever it is. And, and I, as much as they, I, you know, it sometimes it drives me crazy. I love my patients and it's fun to like interact with them sometimes. Some of them, not that sometimes, but sometimes they're great. And so, you know, I think that, um, there is no honest and there's no perfect way to do this. And I think one of the most eye-opening moments that I had, uh, there was a, a, a very senior female. She's now um, in, you know, in the Department of Medicine. She's like the second highest person, but she was my residency director when I was a resident. And I remember her saying, there's a whole period of like nine years when I felt like I was a failure at absolutely everything. Like my kids were young and I was, you know, uh, you know, a young junior attending and I had my research and I just felt like I was just holding on with my nails to keep myself like, you know, above, keep my head above water. And she said, and you get through it and your kids get a little bit older and you get into your groove and you start to figure things out and, and some things, you know, fall off your plate and some things get added on. And it's a different, like, you know, whatever, but you start to understand that that feeling comes and goes and that's normal. And it felt good to know that there was somebody else who was feeling exactly the same way I felt. So your days, your weeks, your months are going to be very, very different depending on whether it's an NIH deadline or it's summer school or whatever it is. And there's gonna be peaks and troughs all the time and enjoy the ride. Um, but don't go seeking that work-life balance. That is like the worst myth that has ever been created. But again, maybe an unpopular opinion. <laughs>
No, I totally agree. And you all were witness to, <laughs> to my own. <laughs> um, and I, I totally agree with that mythical um, boundary, um, you know, discourse that's out there. And if anything, I'm sorry, um, balance. If anything, um, I find boundaries to be more, more helpful of a metaphor. Um, and, um, you know, in terms of things like, you know, not checking my work email on the weekends. Um, and unless I'm on call or unless I have an NIH grant due, I, I don't work on the weekends. Um, those are boundaries. I don't think of that as balance because sometimes I do. Um, you know, there are times when those boundaries need to be, need to be moved a little bit. Um, usually I lock my home office door when I'm giving a presentation, <laughs> but sometimes those boundaries are porous. Um, in terms of what my um, days, months, years look like, um, similarly, they vary from week to week. And in academic medicine, um, we often think about our, well, we're not often, we're um, forced to think about our time mathematically and percentages and how much time uh, usually um, it's how much time are you clinical and then everything else you sort of have to buy yourself out or if you're at a, a, um, a generous institution or if you have, um, you know, some sort of endowed professorship, then it's a little more reliable. And so uh, for me right now, 25% of my time is clinical um, and that amounts to about um, five or six days a month of clinical work, which doesn't sound very much if you're someone who's just finished their residency and has been working um, eight days a week, um, but it somehow manages to fill up the time and be, be gratifying. Um, I personally wouldn't, as an OBGYN in a surgical subspecialty, I wouldn't wanna go much lower than that. So I'm very happy with, with, with that um, distribution. And so what does the rest of my 75% of the time look like? Um, most of it is funded by research grants and then also a few um, uh, education curriculum roles in the medical school. But what you do with that time, this is also where, where balance um, doesn't really fit in because it all just gets folded in. Am I spending 75% of my time on that NIH grant? You know, no, I mean, all of it is related to my career development. I have a career development NIH award. It's all related to it in some way, but in terms of how much time I spend on the actual science of it, you know, some weeks it's more than others. Um, and so, um, you know, my, my weeks, every, everyone looks a little bit different, um, but I generally do, one thing that I try to do in terms of boundaries is I try to block out um, at least a half of a day that's for, um, reading and catching up and, and, um, and writing, working on actual manuscripts. So I try to, I, and I have that listed on my Outlook count calendar as writing group meet, or research group meeting. Um, it's a meeting with just me, but, um, but that's a way also that I try to impose some boundaries so that people don't schedule me for other things. Um, yeah, so for my, um, my, I agree with everything I've been said about work-life balance, and I, I also do this thing where I block things off my calendar just so that people can schedule something on there. Um, it's kind of a protection mechanism, if you will. If you don't, someone will find some way to squeeze something into that 15 minutes you didn't account for. Um, it doesn't matter if it's between 12 and 1 either. If you try to get something to eat, there are no boundaries. Um, so I do spend most of my time uh, doing research in terms of uh, what I was describing earlier. So how, how to look at uh, discovery, biology, and immunology, and how does that translate into early clinical development? How can we design a study to really uh, understand whether or not uh, a new compound is going to affect the immune system in the way that um, And then when the studies are running, I, I also put on my MD hat and I serve as the, the health edition. So basically any adverse events that come up during a study, the investigator contacts me and uh, we go through it. So uh, not that I don't um, interact with the clinical training that I've had when I'm uh, the, the research for the pharmaceutical company. And then I also see patients more formally in the rheumatology uh, fellows clinic at Yale. Uh, with the fellows, so that gives me a chance also to work with trainees, and um, you know that b both aspects keep me uh, up to date. So I have to know what's coming down the pike because this is where the field is going in terms of new medications or new biological targets to develop medications for, and then also seeing patients.
patients with trainees, they have to learn how to become a rheumatologist, so I have to stay up to date with that. Um, and to me, this was a, a good balance, and like, like I said earlier, that's something that I thought existed, and I think part of that is uh, there's sometimes this wall that, that might exist between industry and academia for whatever reason. Uh, having been on both sides now, I see that there's actually no point to this wall existing. Um, and in fact, it probably slows things down for, for what I do anyway. Um, and, you know, a lot of what you're hearing too, and we'll hear from Dr. Paredes in a while, in a moment, um, is kind of you have to figure out your own um, breakdown of time. Some of it is going to be determined depending on where you are in your stage. Like Dr. Suffren is mentioning this 75-25 split which is the typical split that you might find yourself in, especially if there's a training grant involved because there are some limits on how much clinical time you can have versus research time. So those are things to, to bear in mind, but that can be molded as time goes on and especially um, later on, depending on how your research is going or depending on how your, your clinical uh, practice is going, you may have to increase or decrease the, the width of some of those percentages. Uh, so. Flexibility, I think, is the key, one of the key words here. So boundaries, flexibilities, knowing what things are sort of unicorns, as Dr. Bishop was saying, like it's not going to happen in an idealistic way and you kind of have to roll with the punches sort of thing. I agree with everything that has been said. Um, a couple of things. Um, one, you know, I think Dr. Mensa mentioned the flexibility. As you can hear, I think part of it is just um, being able to go with the flow. It doesn't always mean like you like it, um, but being able to just, you know, it's almost like with the patient encounter, so, you know, so there could be challenges and differences, but being able to kind of keep it, you know, keep moving forward and uh, positivity, you know, and part of that positivity does have to come, I think everyone's touched on just really enjoying the question, what, you know, what you're doing. And I, as you hear from everybody, it's come from different sources where that question and, and fire comes from. But it really is a driver, and, and it makes uh, the challenges worth it, and it makes the everything just seem like, yeah, I love it. You know, um, it makes the ups and downs just um, much, you know, as part of the, the the whole process. And I think keeps at least me motivated. So having in that flexibility, um, and I think part of that comes I, for me at least a little bit the idea of imposter syndrome and I bring that up because you know the work balance life for me when I first I'm like oh my gosh I've been doing everything wrong because I feel like I'm running around like you know like in my grandma's house with chicken with its head cut off like no way like I, I must not be doing it because all my colleagues seem so poised and you know and when I was like the only woman in my class or the only underrepresented like I, I just am not, what am I doing here? Um, and in my head, I, it's, it seems so overwhelming. And then I realized part of it is I, it, you know, it, this is a hard job, but it's fun, you know, and we're all going through this. And I think what I also hear a lot, and I think more and more is being spoken with is like talking about it and sharing and realizing we're all, you know, stressed out or we're all, you know, have that grant that we wish could have gotten funded or that project that isn't going the right way. And, um, you know, finding that uh, your colleagues and niche definitely helped me realize, hey, you know, this is part of my community and I can find my niche within this community, but also then reminded me, okay, I can ask for, there are times, you know, I think as everyone was mentioning, I have to do a little bit more research and have to give up a little bit of something and ask someone's help for that. And that's okay. I, I can ask that and in exchange next year or next period, I will pitch in this in exchange for that. But being able to kind of being out of that flexibility also means being an advocate for yourself and establishing those boundaries and those moments where nothing is a hundred percent, you know, you're going to have to open the door, you know, on, on your little one. I know I have to sometimes and I'm like, no, um, but that's okay. You know, it's part of life. Um, and I think hopefully, like, I think that's more and more becoming more, uh, more apparent and more verbalized that, that we are all trying to do our very best and we're so privileged to be here. Um, and there's some asks that we have, like, and that's part of it is being a community and supporting each other through this, um, through this whole process. And, and oh, I'll just add real quick, because I think it was a question I saw in the chat. I, I mean, there was a question about how do you integrate your advocacy with all of this other work that you do? And I'll say, first of all, I do have two young kids. I, I have a 10 and a six-year-old, and I try to include them in some of my advocacy. Like, if we're going to go canvassing, they come out with me. If we're going to write postcards, do letters, we're going to do that. 
sometimes my advocacy is not something that they can do. I know it's meetings, a lot of meetings, a lot of evening meetings. Um, but, you know, I will say that it has helped me a lot with dealing with some of the low points in my career, some of the harder times, some of the more challenging times. And I think it was, uh, I heard an interview with Vivek Murthy, who's our Surgeon General, on a podcast. And he said, you know, at those times when, and we all have them, and I think it's important to acknowledge where we feel our, like we have no worth, we're failing at things, we are not contributing, we're not our best, or we maybe are, 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 are not productive or whatever way. He said, it's that those times that service to others reminds us of who we are and the importance that we have, even if, you know, by standard metrics, we don't feel like we are. And it's very, very true. Um, and so, you know, I, I do think that Sci we need more advocates in science and, and in healthcare, we need people to speak up a little bit more. And I think for anybody just dipping your toes in that is going to be really important, but I also think it can help you a lot so that when the grants are getting rejected and the papers are getting rejected and everybody is sort of down on whatever it is, you can say, look, I still, I, I'm still doing something good. It's still um, important. It matters and, and it's making a meaningful difference and it, it does help a lot. Thank you all. I think this is a very important topic. So thank you all for your advice. So the next question is a two part question. And the first part was actually what we were just discussing. So if other people can chime in about how students can get involved in advocacy work now and in medical school and in the future, and also how they can make the most of their research opportunities and find their research niche. And if that needs to happen now, later, or when they need to have that all sorted out. I wanted to touch on that second question about the research niche and, and um, I think there was an aspect uh, I saw in the question about, you know, is it bad to flip and, and, and change and, um, you know, as I think hopefully you've heard from all of us, like nothing is a straightforward path, you know, and uh, I always like to think of it as, especially on a path like a physician scientist, you know, um, there's nothing lost, like if you're learning something and gaining a skill set um, or using something to kind of motivate an interest or a creative aspect, it, it's well spent. You know, I, I would, especially as an undergrad, I think there was an undergrad aspect to that. Um, you know, I did not think about medical school at all. And I actually was uh, on the road to veterinary school and deferred it uh, while I took time in my gap year. Um, and, you know, I remember like a lot of uh, colleagues at that time and family were like, wow, you spent you know, high school and all that time you know, being animal tech and learning and all that. And I'm like, well, I think it's still important. I learned skills. And now with my piglet work, um, uh, some of macaque and mount mummers, monkey uh, work that I do in the lab, all that skill set um, and the what I learned about animal care, humane treatment of like animal models, all that like is stuff that like way back that I hearken back to, you know, and, and I never doubted that somehow that will be a part of me, even if not directly. And now I'm using it a little bit more and more. So for me, I, I just urge you guys, you know, what are you passionate about? You know, and things will change, questions change. You hope that they change because science and, and clinical stuff are changing all the time. I know in my field in neurology, you know, things that once were considered epilepsy, it's not a broader term. You know, we're incorporating neurodevelopment, uh, conditions that are originally thought to be psychiatric, such as autism and cerebral palsy, are now molding in there. So, um, you know, things that you are think are at silos or categories today, we hope that they're kind of blown up and rethought and re-envisioned in the future. So it's really about like, what do you love? Like for me, I love the brain. I love looking at cells and I love understanding how that, what that means in behavior and, you know, what that means in young kids and what, how, how young kid, how we can influence them to be, you know, a, a healthier and better adult in the cognitive, you know, though from that, from your passion, the questions will come, the questions will come and, um, and, you, and people will see, it. you know, you'll be surprised like 30 years from now, go back and you'll be like, oh, I have an interesting story arc. Um, but you wouldn't think of it today, you know? So don't, you know, uh, really follow your instincts about what you like and what you enjoy. Um, so I can talk briefly. Um, advocacy is actually a huge part of, my, of what I do. And it's even, you know, the first word in the name of my research group, which is advocacy and research on reproductive wellness of incarcerated people, which is a mouthful. So we call it RWIP. I'll put the link to our um, 
um, our website in the chat box because you'll see an example of a lot of, or you'll see how we put advocacy into action. Um, so I could talk about this all day, but I'm not going to. I'm just going to try to be um, succinct and say that advocacy means a lot of different things. It doesn't always mean, you know, um, walking the halls of Congress with your white coat, um, talking to lawmakers about why they should pass this bill, although it can mean that. Um, uh, but I think what um, for me, the way that I've, you know, some of the advocacy I've done and the way I started was just organic. I was working in a jail, um, became, you know, so angered by the way pregnant people were being treated and got, you know, was somehow put in touch with people in San Francisco who were working on legislation. They were like, you're a doctor. We need a doctor. We need an expert voice on this. And so I just sort of fell into that. And then over the years, I've actually taken trainings. Um, you know, it's, some of it is not intuitive, but I've been fortunate to um, be part of some um, physician leadership, advocacy leadership trainings and so sort of honed my skills through that. Um, but I think from a research perspective, what it also means for me is um, the research questions that I ask and the ways that I make data available, um, I'm very intentional and I work with um, my partners on the ground. Like, hey, what's gonna be helpful for you? Um, not that they, you know, they don't write my research grants or the questions, but I wanna know, you know, what kinds of, you know, this is, this is a research area that I'm interested in. Is this gonna be helpful for you? And in advancing, you know, um, some sort of advocacy effort. Um, and if they say no, that doesn't mean I automatically won't do it. I'm a scientist. I don't, you know, I'm not in, informed by um, by the political questions per se, but I, I work and I'm led by the people on the ground. Um, and I strive to make my data publicly available when, you know, when possible. And so that's another reason why I have a website um, uh, so we can um, disseminate our information. Um, so advocacy can look like a lot of different things. Um, and while I myself do a lot of media, uh, I talk to the media a lot and um, and I do walk the halls of Congress and, and at, at various federal and state levels, but it doesn't always have to be that way. Even just making your data understandable for um, the public and for, for people at organizations who can, can use those data is really quite powerful. I think uh, one of the questions that, oh, are you even gonna go? Okay. I think one of the questions that uh, came up in the chat was how to stay involved as a student in, in advocacy and then continue that in your career. And you've heard examples of, of the career aspect and um, from the student level to, to get involved in medical school and graduate school and continue that. There are no, numerous organizations uh, that have physician level bodies and then they have uh, a medical student section. And so the AMA is one example of that. Uh, there's an organization called the American Medical Women's Association that advocates for um, the, the, you know, it'll, it'll sound as saying the needs of female physicians, but really it's something that benefits the entire physician community to be advocating for, for the needs of any one subgroup of physicians. There's a National uh, Medical Association, which uh, serves primarily um, African American and African descent uh, physicians, and then there's a, a similar group for Asian descent and uh, Latino descent. Uh, so there are various groups that kind of are, we can call them affinity groups, if you like, and they sort of um, reach out to communities that may have been marginalized in some way uh, in in our healthcare system, and they do activities such as the advocacy work that could take you to Capitol Hill and really lobby on behalf of anything from reforming medical education to getting that Affordable Care Act passed in, in 2010. And so these are ways that you can sort of get involved at the student level, and that's a way to also interact with physicians who are leading the way in terms of advocacy. Maybe you'll meet some of the people on the panel and doing some of those activities. Um, I've been involved with APSA for 15 or 16 years, um, and that's the way that I also give back to the community. I'm doing this panel now, but we also have other activities that I'm sure Michael and Brianna will um, let you know about so you can participate in those. Um, I helped uh, some colleagues at Yale put together an R01 grant that hopefully will get funded to look at underrepresented minorities uh, who are applying to research careers as medical students and sort of barriers might be to, to entering this uh, career path. So. Uh, there are various ways you can get involved with advocacy. I think at the student level and trainee level, you're not shut out from from being part of some of these larger organizations. 
and I'll also make a plug um, for Doctors for America because Michael is also here. And um, <laughs> yes, and he just wrote something in the chat too. So I'd be remiss by not saying something. So Doctors for America, um, I actually, I, I will tell you that there's something very personal for me because I was a patient and um, I, when I was, you know, I, when I was sick, I was, I just crawling my way back into medical school and watching this organization standing up for access to medical care that would have been life-saving for me and my family without question. Um, and I felt so grateful to see doctors standing up for patients. And I can tell you that patients appreciate that more than you can ever understand. Um, join Doctors for America now on the board. And I'll say there are great opportunities there. They're, they have different um, groups of advocacy. You can find the one that is fits best with you. But they also have every month, they have boot camps that will teach you about how to write an op-ed, um, how to talk to a, you know, a, a legislator or a policymaker, um, how to start a group or a petition or something like that, like all the little things that we don't really learn in medical school, but you probably need in order to make your voice sort of heard. And it's a great way to network with folks who are doing that really successfully um, and to kind of get support from them for how to do those things in, in a forum that is very, very pro-advocacy and will support you every step of the way. So a really great organization. I, I'm sure Michael's gonna yell at me if I don't mention we have our National Leadership Conference coming up. And that's a great way to listen to and hear really incredible people and sort of hear uh, the whole group of all of us. And I mean, there's literally thousands and thousands of people in every state across the United States. And so a, a wonderful community of other doctors and scientists and medical students who are interested in advocacy and can help you with that whole process. It's not as scary as you think. Thank you all. So we're almost at time, so I'll ask one final question, but thank you again to all the panelists and Michael as well for answering the questions that have been in the chat that we didn't have a chance to address. So our last question is the typical panel question, which is what do you wish you knew um, before you started training about being a physician scientist, about life, about anything? Do you have any final words of advice for our um, attendees? You already gave a lot of advice. <laughs> uh, but yeah, if you have anything, any concluding thoughts? I'll go first, because again, I took such a weird route. Um, I would just say, I think that the worst thing that happened in my life was one of the worst things that happened in my life was actually one of ended up being one of the best things because I you know, I got very sick and I, I had to drop out of my MD PhD program and I felt like I was a failure and then I realized that I really didn't like the PhD that I thought I liked and I really loved something else so roll with the punches um, because you act, they, they actually can learn quite a bit. And this applies when, you know, when I get a grant rejected and you feel terrible, come back a week later, read those rejection comments. And I've always realized that no matter how bad and stinging the rejections were, they actually made the proposal, the manuscript, whatever it was better at the end of the day. I learned something from them. So it is tough sometimes, but roll with the punches and be flexible because things will turn out. You will find your true compass, I promise. It may not be the easiest way, it may not be the way you thought, but you'll end up where you needed to be as long as you continue to, to follow your passion. I think one of the key messages here, one of the key messages here is to really uh, try to figure out what you're passionate about. Try to figure out what what you think will motivate you and keep you going uh, long term. Because uh, you know we talked about um, schedules not being nine to five, and you know all sorts of things buy for your attention. So you really need to be very passionate about what you do in order to weather that. You know, um, and being flexible. I think that's the flexible is probably like the key word. If we made a word cloud for this uh, discussion, flexible would be like the biggest one on there. And um, but along with flexibility comes sort of uh, keeping your eyes and ears open to opportunities because sometimes things come up and if you're not open minded enough to sort of see how that fits into what you're passionate about, you may lose the opportunity. Doesn't mean that others won't come by, but I think, I mean, everyone here, their careers sort of 
wound up where it is because an opportunity opened up and people didn't necessarily say, no, I think I'm going to stick with this thing that I've been doing for the longest time. So um, it sounds, I'll say that if someone had told me that when I was in, uh, finishing undergrad, I would have been a bit skeptical because again, everything in medical training seemed to have, you know, very prescribed pattern to it. And now you're saying, well, if this comes up, why don't you take that route and see where it goes? And, you know, it's like, well, that's my career you're talking about. Like, what if I make the wrong turn? And so that's the other thing. If you if you find yourself making a turn that's not the right one, you have to correct yourself. Like, just don't give up on trying to see where there's opportunity. And, you know, everyone that I've met in academic medicine or doing research or even clinical practice, their unique story comes from realizing how to make their career fit their interests in, in whatever way possible. And um, if you find yourself not interested in what you're doing, try to think about finding something else to do. You know, I'm not saying like quit being a physician, but you can find something within what you're doing to make yourself uh, feel that you're fulfilled throughout your day. I think that's the message that you're sort of getting. It's not easy as you just heard, but I think having a, an open and prepared mind would, would help make it easier. Honestly, I don't know if I have much more to add to, to that. I, I agree and wish that I had, I had known those things as well. Um, maybe I'll just end with a question that, um, that one of my mentors uh, asked me when I was not an undergraduate, um, but when I was um, you know, a fellow and deciding, should I, I'm already a doctor and did my residency, should I go back to graduate school? And he said, do you need a PhD to do what you wanna do? And and I, that was my quest to answer that question. And I didn't know the answer, but I felt this compulsion and I, I felt like I needed a connection to a, a deeper connection to the intellectual community and a deeper engagement with the theory. And so I guess I wound up feeling like, I think I need it, but I also want it. I want that deeper engagement. Um, and for me, it ultimately absolutely was the right, the right path, but I didn't really have an answer to that what sounded like a very clear cut question. <laughs> and that's okay, that's okay. Cause as you've heard throughout this whole thing and, and the, the last two comments, like your path will take you places and um, you can't predict them. Um, and you just have to be taken along that path with the, your passion being the one thing that guides you. I agree with everything that is said. Um, the only thing I will add, uh, you know, highlighting the passion and the excitement um, is uh, you guys are at an early stage. And one thing that I didn't appreciate so much is how much mentors and sponsors um, asking for that helping hand to take me to the next stage, um, how, how important that would be. I knew I would have role models and guides that I'd hope to identify and was fortunate to find, but it's really critical. It helps you get to that next stage and um, to look for them, to be okay, you know, uh, treat them as a valuable relationship. Um, like any relationship, you know, uh, mentors give and um, you give back by, by being a good mentee and connecting and give back by when you're at the next stage, mentoring the people who are behind you. Um, and I didn't really think of this as a pipeline in that sense until, you know, later on and seeing, wow, all the interconnectedness and the networks that could form and uh, we're hoping to continue to form. Um, and that helps both kind of re-engage in, in a path that, um, you know, right now I, I imagine we all seem like we've hit, you know, of course you would be X person doing this and Y, but through the process, I don't, I know I didn't know that I would be at this stage. And so when you're early on, you're also reminding yourself, you should be in some ways the different person because you are such a unique you know, we talked about unicorns in a way, but we are, you know, not many people are going to be doing that part of that, you know, clinical field of that advocacy work. So there might be times that you're, you're going to feel a little bit, am I doing the right thing? Um, do I really, is this, you know, not only do I belong, but is this really the right approach? Am I going to find a, and having the mentors and guides also help you kind of stay on, you know, again, the courses like this, but knowing that there is a next stage, um, uh, and that there will be people out there wanting to help you do that um, and you know being okay asking for that help. 
big thank you to all the panelists. We actually wanted to ask about being a mentee. So thank you for touching on that. Um, and yeah, this has been a fantastic session. So thank you all for being our panelists today. And thank you to all the attendees. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a great one.